so so I would like to all of you uh, to go to the kahoot.it. Um, this is the best one would be if you have a different device. So you might have a phone if, which you could use and then you could keep the screen or you can make the screen split so that you have on one side um, the, uh, your own answers as what you are going to put in. On the other side, you have the, the general results and the general questions. So to see how you can do it best as if you can do it divided on your screen, you could do it or as I say, take a phone and put kahoot.it into the phone. So I will stop this now and I will go to the Kahoot and uh, please you get a, an, in a moment you get a pin number. So it's a so this is the pin number. If you put this into your phone now, and when you have Kahoot ID. Yeah, I stopped the music. Sorry about this. <laughs> Otherwise, it's really hard talking against the music when I read the questions. Wow, everyone knows how to do the Kahoot. It's brilliant. Everyone is already in. You must have, maybe some, many have done it already before. So I was told I can play with 2,000 people. So there should be no problem with all of you to come in. We should have, I think we were 80. Is this right, Talasi? Talasi? We have 90 with all of us here. So we're probably yeah. looking at about 80, 84. Yeah. So we might wait a moment longer for people to have a go to get in. We will have about nine or ten per row, so we have maybe sixty in at the moment. If you if you if you don't have a device to join us, um, don't worry. You can always make a guess while we are doing the things. Obviously, you won't be the winner of the quiz, and your name won't be appearing there. But um, uh, you can still kind of guess the questions. And, and what you will have, you will have on the um, on this uh, the screen I am sharing. You will have the questions, but then you will have um, colors for your own answers. If you have it on the phone, for example, you will have only a green section. And you need to check on the screen what is the answer in the green section. Yes, yeah? so you need to kind of compare it to the main screen because the telephone is too small. So it doesn't give you the full answer. So it gives you only color green, color red, color yellow, and you need to choose the right color. And this um, quiz is also on um, speed. So the one who is on top is the person who is hitting the button the fast, also gives the, the right answer the fastest. Yeah, so it's not being obviously you have to be right first. But then if you are the fastest, you will be on top of the leaderboard. Okay. So I think we are maybe all, everyone is in now, I would guess. Or is there someone still popping in at 70 at the moment? We probably have a few more, but I don't know how much of that is tech related. Yeah, so give me, and there's another one coming in. So maybe give it a few more seconds and then we get started. As I say, if you don't have managed to come in in time, you can always guess along as well because you will see the question. You can just do it for yourself that you always get the answer. Like you do in television or something when you watch a show and you kind of not one of the persons, but you still guess what, what is the right answer. No? You might sometimes do this with quiz sessions. Okay, so I think I will start it now. The first question is, how do you define climate change? And you can see the different answers here on the screen. So if someone actually can't read what is on the screen, could you make a note in the chat, um, send it to the chat that we can make sure we read the answers all out for you? <laughs> Great, so 20 got it right. Any change in the climate over time is how you define climate change. Any change in the climate over time. So it can be going up or going down. The temperature might going, be going up or down. Um, it can be both ways. As a, any change in the climate over time is how you define climate change. And 20 got it right. See, Let's see who was the fastest to give this answer. Will be at 
it is, I don't know if I pronounce it right, it's a Shekit. Shekit has the highest points now with 900. Okay, let's go to the next question. It's true or false. Climate scientists agree that the climate has always changed. Is this true or is this false? Wow, great. You really remembered this from last time or did know it anyway. 63 say it has always changed and this is right. So the climate scientists agree that the climate has always changed, but what some say, um, most say that it's actually done by humans, a few say it's done by volcanoes or something else, but they all agree that the climate has always changed. Well done. So let's see who has now is at the top as the fastest. Someone with an A that doesn't give away <laughs> the name. So someone A is actually at the top. Well done. So let's go to the next question. Scientific consensus that climate change is caused by human is, and then you have to choose a percentage now. Also red would be 50%, blue 68%, yellow 97%, green 75%. Yeah, 41 got it right, 97%. So 97% of scientists agree that climate change is caused by humans. Let's see who was the fastest to give this answer. It is still the A person. <laughs> no, we don't know the full name at the top. Okay, let's go to the next question. It is Abby with Whitefield. Oh, okay. <laughs> So how many countries in the world have on average higher temperature since 2010? If you remember, we saw a video about this last time. Yeah, it's, it's all of them. If you remember the video, it was every every country in the world turned red at the end. Also for the last 20 years, every country had red was kind of showing that the temperature was higher on average than it was before. And every country in the world was turning red. So 35 got it right. Well done. Let's see if we have still A at the top. Yeah, consistently pressing the button the fastest as well and getting it right. Okay, so let's go to the next question. What are possible solutions for climate change? You might remember Project Drawdown, what we had there. Oh, well done. 66 got it right. It was all of the above, all of the three different solutions you had on this on the slide here. So is, did you say Abby is A? Yeah, Abby is still first, followed by Noah. Let's go to the next question. According to Project Drawdown, which of the following is a solution with, solution with the highest impact? This is red install onshore wind turbines, blue manage refrigeration chemicals, yellow eat more plants and less meat, or green cut down on food waste. I didn't remember it well. It was it is managed refrigeration chemicals is is a is a solution with the highest impact according to project drawdown. Okay, let's see. Still have Abby and Noah at the top. Josephine just moving up. Let's go for true or false. As the impacts of climate change accelerate, extreme weather weather events are taking a major toll in developing countries. Is this true or false? Yeah, it's, you're right. It's a 71. 
who got it right, it is true that actually that um, the extreme weather events are taking major toll in developing countries. And this is the first question of the ones where we now move over to climate justice. So we are having now questions which you, where you might not know the answer before where you might have to guess or you might know already something from somewhere else about it. So let's see how the leaderboard looks. This is the same three people at the top. Let's see how it's going on now. As I know there are questions which you might not know because we didn't do them last time. So who will most likely be hit hardest by climate change? Will it be Kenya in the red, India in the blue, US in the yellow or China in the green? It's Kenya, and I think a lot of people got it right. So 34 got it right that Kenya will be the hardest hit, according to it. By the way, it's data from the UN, who has they have used different data sets to evaluate which country is the most vulnerable, uh, taking everything together, as a flood, drought, and everything together. So A and Abby and Noah staying at the top, and MG say she is coming up. The UK has experienced recently frequent flooding. How vulnerable is the UK? What do you think out of 181 countries which were analyzed by the UN? Do you think it's the least vulnerable? It's the 67th vulnerable, 130th vulnerable, or 8th vulnerable? And even 181 always being the most vulnerable. It's the eighth vulnerable, and I think 12 of you got it right. So it is not very vulnerable, actually. It's very much at the bottom, um, um, even so some people here might see themselves as quite vulnerable to it. So Abby and Noah are still at the top. They might know these answers too. Okay, let's see with the next one. How vulnerable is the US? Would you say it's 22nd most vulnerable in the red? 45th in the blue, 5th in the yellow, or 70th in the green. So 25 of you got it right. It's the 22nd, uh, um, as a quite, again, more vulnerable than the UK, but uh, given to compared to a lot of other countries, not so vulnerable in compared to others. Even so you might have experienced it differently in the summer if you're in the US with having lots of fires and things like this. So now we have a move. ID is at the top and then Geronimo. Obviously people, if people don't know the data, they might have to guess now. Let's do the so how would you order the following countries in order of vulnerability, less to high vulnerability? So would you order them like um, India, Bangladesh, Kenya, Solomon Islands, with Solomon Islands being the most vulnerable, or in the blue, Bangladesh, India, Solomon Islands, Kenya, with Kenya, for example, being the most vulnerable? And, and the other options in yellow and green. K11 got it right. It's India, Bangladesh, Kenya, Solomon Islands. Solomon Islands, because of the flooding, one of the islands, uh, which where a lot of the islands might disappear in the um, in the next time. So therefore, they are the, one of the most vulnerable uh, when you rank them all together. So we have Geronimo being now at the top. ID second. Let's go to the next question. Why are the four countries listed in question 11, as in the, in the one before, so vulnerable? Is it that they have red, no money for climate adaptation? Is it blue flooding? Is it yellow droughts? Or is it green, all of the above? Yeah. Many of you got it right, 54, it's all of the above. So it's a combination of every country is different. So some might have only flooding, only in the 
and some have have mostly droughts, but some have a mixture of both. And uh, money, for, no money for climate adaptation is quite often also a major issue. So therefore, you were for 54 got it right. And we have the same three at the top: Geronimo, ID, and Emma. Which of the countries below is responsible for the highest amount of carbon emissions per person? So this is now going for the emitters. Is this New Zealand in red, uh, India in blue, UK in yellow, or China in green? This is for a lot of people a surprise question, and only five got it right. So it is New Zealand actually who has a who is responsible for the highest amount of carbon emissions per person. So it's not per country, it's per person. So it's actually the amount the country emits and then divided by the people living there. And therefore, in, there, in this context, New Zealand is very high when you compare it to the other four countries I have, the three countries I have given you here in this part. But Geronimo still got it right. He might know the data. He has to tell us later if he knows all the vulnerability data and uh, the other data as well. Okay, let's go to the next one. Which of these high emitters of carbon is also higher on the vulnerability ranking, also above place 60 out of the 181? And we had already US and United Kingdom in this quiz. Maybe you remember. So China and Germany. So who is actually higher on the vulnerability ranking? which means would get more problems now and in the future from climate change. It's China, yeah, and more people got it right. Because um, also US and UK, you saw already before, and Germany is also very, very low. It's also like the UK, it's below the, um, the, the 10 least vulnerable uh, countries. And China is shortly above 60. If I would have asked you which of the high emitters of carbon is also higher on the world ranking and is above 100, there would have been no one. So all the high emitters of carbon are actually all less vulnerable, while the, it's the other way around for the vulnerable countries, none of them is a high emitter. Let's see with the Geronimo still at the top, Emma and then ID. Okay, let's see. Final question. Which of these high vulnerable countries has an energy consumption per person comparable to any EU nations? A nation. So red India, blue Bangladesh, yellow Kenya, and green none of the above. Yeah, I think I gave it a bit away by what I said with the question before. It's none of the above. So actually, none, also all the high vulnerable countries are all low emitters, while most countries or all countries in the EU um, are high emitters and are not so vulnerable. Yeah, so it's kind of, um, and you can see it across all countries in the world, unfortunately. So let's see where who has actually overall done well in this quiz. On play three, it's Emma. On two is ID. And on one is Geronimo. Okay. And then runners up are Rohit and Eamon, you can see there. Okay, thanks very much. So I think Geronimo has to put in the chat now why he didn't know all these answers. Yeah, would you like to share with us? Do you know all the data or was it just guessing? Or did you? You know all the data, or you can also speak if you like, Geronimo. Mm. Is he putting some? Ah, yes. Some answers yeah. just surprised me. Some I got them right, and some I got them wrong. But generally, I think I got the idea. Yeah. Okay. So you got twelve out of fifteen right. No. So you got quite a lot right. Well done. Okay. So then let's go back to the slides. Um, hope you enjoyed the Kahoot. 
So I will go, um, the next part is still a bit uh, on the climate justice aspect and I, what I'm sharing with you, and this is why they look quite differently, are slides which are made by the Climate Reality Project. And the Climate Reality Project um, is something which Al Gore, who was a, a vice president in the United States um, um, around 2000, also shortly before 2000, um, so he was already, when he was vice president, very passionate about climate change. And he also designed, a, also he was responsible for a cinema, um, also for a movie which was in the cinemas as well. And he has been really working on this topic yeah, all this time since he was vice president, trying to make people aware of what is happening, trying to get them to engage, engage with this. And he has initiated the Climate Reality Project and you can do a training with him. So it's kind of with him and all his facilitators. So they offer it regularly. So if you can, after the hour training, when you have done all eight hours, if you want to, to get into a deeper understanding, you might want to also join um, the Climate Reality Project from Al Gore. It is very different to, to this training because this training has a strong focus on climate solution and doing an action plan um, at the end. Uh, I think what you learn a lot in Al Gore's presentation is really about um, how countries are affected and, and he will share much, much more what is the impact climate change has already on all the different nations. You will also hear about solutions in, in, in the training, but it's um, a, a big, big proportion is really um, dedicated to um, understanding what are the problems we have because of climate change already. And he will go into different areas. So what is the problem with which we have with food supply already? What is the problems we have with um, biodiversity and so on. So he will go into this in much more detail than I do in this training. So if you want to do it in addition to this training, I would, um, also you, you please, please go ahead and I have the links after these slides, I will give you the links. Um, so I have just copied and pasted because I have, I have done his training this summer. And so I'm um, actually, um, uh, what does this call climate reality leader. Um, so I'm allowed to use the, the, the slides and I have copied this slide, but somehow I couldn't manage to get the numbers right at the bottom as the moment you copy it into the slideshow, it makes them all messed up. So on the left hand side, if you could read it properly, there's 1880. So it's the year 1880. On the right hand side, it's the year 2020. Um, and you can see, uh, similar to what we have seen for each country, if you take the global surface temperature, so the average for the whole world, you can see how it has been um, in 1880 on average lower than before. And then it has become slightly higher. And obviously now it has become higher, 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 higher. You can see how it has been consistently higher um, uh, in the last uh, 20 years. Yeah, so this is um, a slide he's providing. So, and there's a 72% chance that 2020 will be the new hottest year ever, because, you know, we have heard in the news all these years, like in the last 20 years, most years we hear that it's the hottest year ever. And it's quite like the 2020 will now be the new hottest year ever, if you take the average for the whole world. And this one is one which shows you the different extreme weather catastrophes, and it shows you how it has actually risen from 1980, um, uh, when you had this, this kind of combination uh, of, of floods, of storms, and of extreme temperatures, droughts, and fires. You can see how much we had from each in 1980, and you can compare it to 2019, how much we have a combination of storms, floods, and extreme temperatures, fires, uh, in 2019, because sometimes people will say, oh yeah, we have had always fires or we had always storms, but when you actually start to, to count how many you have from each, then you can see that there is actually a much, much higher percentage now than we had in, uh, in 1980. And I will give you only a few, what, what Al Gore does is really to always kind of uh, show you the most recent events. So I did this, um, in um, the training at the end of August. So it's, it's slides which we used around this time. I didn't unfortunately have um, time to look at the newest slide pack. I'm sure he has a newer slide pack, which have even recent events. So this is more the ones from the summer and a slide even before. So this was Miami, Florida. Miami just recorded its hottest week ever. Then this is from Bangladesh. And I um, thought it was also the quote um, from the farmer there is, um, all our crops, even our trees have been destroyed. What will we do? 
And this is actually from uh, this year as well from uh, the 21st of May. Then obviously you can see with the kids here um, that uh, it's especially hard in the time of COVID to have all these um, um, cyclones and so on. So uh, this quote is actually from um, that we are facing a dual challenge of cyclone in the time of COVID-19. And this is a cyclone evacu evacuation camp in Orissa in India in uh, 19th of May 2020 this year. And this one is from Kenya. It's from April 29th. Uh, and this is about 100,000 100, families were displaced by flooding in Kenya. So you can see that there are loads of, and I could, I mean, as I, um, Al Gore is collecting from every country in the world, and he goes on for one and a half hours like this, so that he shows you one country, one major um, uh, uh, catastrophe after the next kind of, so and there are loads. So it's, it is quite, um, as I found it quite depressing to watch it. Um, so there are loads more, but I think what is also really important is that, that uh, you have on one hand, you have the countries who are more vulnerable to it. So we have had, have seen a few of them just now with the slides and we had them in the quiz. But also when you look in the countries who are maybe as a country overall not so vulnerable, like I said to you before in the quiz that the US is um, uh, in itself is not so vulnerable. It's 22 on, on from 181. Also there are lots of countries more over 100. Uh, 50 countries who are more vulnerable than the US. But when you look then more closely, for example, for the US, you will see that in, in the people who are hit hardest by, um, by climate change are all, often in these countries, also in, even in these countries who are not so vulnerable, they are the uh, people from a lower socioeconomic background. So it's often people who are more vulnerable in the country who then are hit hardest by climate change as well. And this is, applies to every country, whether it's the UK, US, Australia, um, uh, it's always a, that, that uh, population who is actually more um, already more vulnerable because of the socioeconomic background is then also hit harder by climate change. So if you want to find out more about this training and you want to sign up, so that I've given you first of all the Climate Reality Project the link here. Um, and then you have also the climate reality training, which you could join. And I believe they do a next training sometime in January or February. They have the next training. It's also for free, so you can join it for free. Um, um, if you are interested in adaptation uh, and mitigation a bit more, as an adaptation is that um, a country is adapting themselves to the climate change, what is already happening. So if you're, for example, in Kenya, um, or in Bangladesh, um, people have to do a lot of adaptation because of the, of the change which climate is already causing. So you will learn about, I have a colleague, for example, here at NTU, um, who is uh, very much working with country, uh, with um, universities in, in Africa, and he is actually looking into adaptation. Also, what is the climate change education we need to do there to adapt um, uh, to climate change? Obviously, in countries which are causing more of the problems to so the one who are higher admitters, it's more a question of mitigation. So they actually need to figure out how we can um, reduce the carbon emission we are, we are putting into the atmosphere so that we don't have to adapt so much in 10 years or 20 years or people in other countries don't have to adapt so much already now. But you will find that in a lot of the countries uh, who are not very vulnerable, if it, whether it's Germany, um, you know that I have German accent, accent so it's, I'm coming from Germany, or whether it's UK where I'm living now. Um, they are actually a lot talking about adaptation, even so they are not very vulnerable at all uh, to, to it. So it's actually um, uh, Germany, I think, is on place three and, and the UK on place eight. So very, very low vulnerability, but a lot of money goes into adaptation. For example, a lot of money goes into making London secure so that London doesn't get flooded. Um, or in Germany, I was uh, was actually on my favorite island, so I love this island a lot, but I still don't want so many euros being put into this German island, which they try to make secure. So actually the, the little piece of beach where my family goes every uh, every summer, they actually spent, um, I think about 500,000 um, euros just for a small piece of the beach to fix it. 
to really kind of build it up again after it had been um, because of the higher uh, um, water levels from the sea had been destroyed. So actually, so they are so spending loads and loads of euros in protecting our tiny islands in Germany. As I say, it's my favorite island in the world, so I would like to actually to it to survive. But it's a question: Should we do this really as a country who is emitting so much? Germany is one of the countries emitting so much. So my own opinion, and you might want to build your own opinion on this, is actually that Germany, for example, should really put all the money into mitigation. How can we reduce our carbon emissions so that we don't have to adapt and we shouldn't put so much money into adaptation um, because I think we are causing it for everyone in the world and then other countries like Bangladesh where they also have flooding they don't have the money like we have in Germany to protect the islands or to protect the coast kind of so I think for me it is really a question of really focusing on mitigation but in case you want to talk, uh, link into, uh, look into this more and also understand more about adaptation um, please, here, here are two of the links. Uh, but this training is mainly about mitigation because I think, as I say, it is for me the most um, urgent thing is now to do the mitigation so that we don't have so much problem in 10 or 20 years' time. And um, when people sometimes, um, I had students, for example, coming from different African countries, and they realized also for themselves that a lot of the students um, who are, for example, studying in the UK are not from the uh, lower socioeconomic background. So actually, if you are from a country which is more vulnerable and might need more adaptation, but you are still the one flying around the world and going everywhere um, on plane, eating loads of meats and stuff like this, it might be more important uh, if so you're from the vulnerable countries still to work on mitigation. So that's why this training is really on mitigation and the focus is on how can we reduce our carbon emissions. Okay, so let's go on. And now I'm handing over to um, Rajul. So I will stop share and Rajul will share, no? Yes, Petra. Okay, Thank so you. I will stop share mine. All right, and I'll start sharing my screen now. I will be sharing about a tool that's called the Global Carbon Atlas and just continuing our discussion with Petra. I will just uh, take us through how this tool is useful for us uh, and, and what, what all can we learn from it. So just give me a second as I go on to the right slide. Okay, that's the right one. And there we go. So uh, the tool is called Global Carbon Atlas. And uh, we'll, we'll take a look at this tool. The link has just been posted in the chat and I'll request just someone from the facilitators to reshare that link again. Uh, you can open it simultaneously as I talk to you and uh, I'll walk you through the different steps uh, about the Global Carbon Atlas and how you can make use of it. So we'll go over step by step understanding uh, what are the consumption levels across the world? And we can take a global overview of it on the world map. We can think about how much of uh, you know, carbon dioxide emissions are created per person in different parts of the world. Uh, we can also take a look at uh, you know, different regions of the world and there are rankings that are available that can be taken a look at. So essentially we'll go through all these steps and I'll start sharing the tool essentially. And now that you have the link, you may wish to explore it simultaneously as we go forward. So I'll bring us to the actual tool. And give me a second. Yeah, sometimes these links just disappear. Okay, just give me a second. I'll have to. Do you want to me to share or? Yeah, I'll, I'll just get to it, Petra. I know sometimes okay. the tool will not just come on to the screen when I'm trying to share. Okay. So click on it once and then it'll start appearing. Yep, should be good mm -hmm. now. I should be able to share now. Yes, it's up here. Okay, and I hope you're able to see it. And this is where you land once you click on the link. So you click on, okay, I get it. I want the map view. 
And you should be able to see on your left hand side the different emissions from different countries. Uh, you can select the countries that are available uh, you know, across the world. So take a look at all different countries listed here, whatever your choice is. You can take a look at all countries, 221 of them, different regions that you have an interest on, groups, and then again, rankings. And these are some of the things that we would like you to do. So consider uh, if you go to type, think of the different types of emissions, where are they coming from, like gas, oil, coal, gas flaring, cement, uh, different consumption levels. Uh, try selecting that one. You can go to countries and select individual countries if you would like to take a look at. And there's a list present here, whatever is a country of interest for yourself. But uh, if we don't want to select countries, we, we also would like to take a look at the units. Think of which units you would like to consider. In our case, we would be considering tons of carbon dioxide emissions per person. So think of that and then think of how you see these blurbs appearing on the map. And these then start showing you what are the carbon dioxide emissions of different countries of the world. And it starts bringing our, our thinking in terms of, yes, our consumption levels, and then simultaneously thinking of the carbon dioxide emissions across the globe. And just as we were talking of vulnerable countries, you will see that the, the situation here is really different. Yes, as populations start changing, as consumption levels start changing from country to country, you'll find that the carbon emissions start changing as well. So thinking of all this, yes, there's so much to explore in the tool. We can go on and on, but then yes, you can think of different regions of the world, selecting individual continents that you can take a look at, different groups, uh, whichever you know, global uh, association uh, countries are part of can be taken a look at, and then the rankings. And these are then something that you, when you want to start comparing, maybe developed countries, developing countries, also, which are the top 10 emitters of the world, these rankings are useful for that purpose. If we start moving to the right side of the tool, you'll see that there are different kinds of views. We are right on uh, now on the map view. We also can take a look at the chart view, so it will show us a different representation of the same information. We can increase or decrease focus, take a look at rankings, time series, and different kinds of bubbles uh, you know, that you would like to show on the map. And so these are essentially different ways of then taking a look at this data that is being presented to us. And uh, also at the bottom is, is a timeline. So if you click on that, it will usually, you know, from historical times, it will start you know, playing for you how the data was gathered and for years that there has been data or no data, and it will express that for you as well. If you go back to the map view, it'll again start showing us, you know, how did the emissions play out, uh, you know, in different years, et cetera. And you can take a look at all that information. At the bottom then, yes, sources of information, how all this data is gathered, is explained, different help features, methods that have gone into the scientific analysis of this data, and you can also share and download from here. So really helpful tool. Another feature that I often find very helpful, and uh, I'll, I'll just point this out because I find it very useful for engaging audiences. If, if we go back to the home button, uh, it, it also gives you a very good historical perspective through the use of the carbon story. And this is something that I love using with my students when I'm talking to them about how did we reach where we are today? and they love to see the historical perspective through the carbon story. So that's something wonderful again. But yes, for our purpose today, uh, we'll give you, give you a tiny task that uh, go to the carbon atlas and I'll stop sharing this. Uh, if you go to the carbon atlas, uh, go and take a look again and I'll, I'll put it for you on the slides here to see. So what we want you to do is, we want you to identify for us the top 10 countries based on the unit of tons of carbon dioxide per person who are the highest emitters of carbon dioxide emissions. So those are the tasks for you. How can you reach that step? If we just think of selecting consumption 
and then in the units, select tons of carbon dioxide per person, and then go to the ranking scale. The tool will identify for you which are the 10 countries, and they are ranked from one to 10, which are the highest emitters of carbon dioxide emissions per person. And I'd like you to list down those countries in the chat for us. So we'll take a few minutes for this work. I guess five minutes. Is that good, Petra? Yeah, I think this should be five minutes. We will see when your answers are coming in. So if you go for it now and then put the moment you have found it out, what um, um, what is the ranking and you put your results there, we will see it. And then when you have it very fast, please try to think about also what are the reasons for these countries to be at the top? So why, what are they doing that they are such high emitters? And put this in the chat too, please. So consider consumption in the type, consider the units as tons of carbon dioxide per person, and then just think of also the reasons, possible reasons of why is this the result? <laughs> why are these countries the highest emitters? Inputs coming into the chat, yes. And uh, it's good how quickly we have managed to reach the data. As the first people have already put the right answer in. So please try to think about um, also the really fast ones here. What could be the reason for the 10 countries you have listed now? Okay, we are nailing it, whether it is getting the correct order or thinking of reasons. I think very good analysis of why these countries are the ones emitting the highest uh, carbon dioxide emissions. Lots of responses and I'll, I'll just narrate some of them. Yes, high dependence on oil, usually small countries which are more dependent on transportation of goods high energy consumptions, overconsumption of products, oil rich countries, rich countries, high GDP per capita, GDP is correlated with energy, which is dependent on fossil fuels. Uh, great analysis. And yes, uh, there are many small countries with high consumption levels as well. Could it be manufacturing? Yes, countries which have high manufacturing as well, uh, dependence on oil. All great answers, Petra. Mm -hmm. yes. and I think it was a, with a um, um, production. Uh, I think it's important that you have looked for consumption now. So obviously when we would look only at the production data, it would be quite different. Uh, because then maybe, um, as, yeah, maybe you want to look at it later if you look at the tool again. So if you look at the production, some countries are at the top, which are now not at the top. At the moment, we're really looking at consumption. So it's the highest amount per person in this country. And I think Luxembourg actually was quite shocked when they were put top on this list. They didn't like to be top on such a list. So they had actually have already reduced um, very much. Um, so. So uh, at the moment, as this data hasn't been updated since 2017, uh, as in this tool, uh, so so they are now better actually. But uh, still, the other countries like Qatar, Kuwait, 
um, they are still in the same very, very high order. That's that they have very high emission. And I think you got really lots of the right answers here. It's it's because they are oil producing countries, because they do everything from oil. Obviously, if you have uh, oil in abundance, you are keen to use the oil kind of, and they don't use, for example, for the air conditioning as one of the high impact solutions. A lot of them don't use solar energy to run the air conditioning. They use the oil, which they have in abundance in these countries. And this makes it so high per person the consumption. No? Yeah, so I think we have pretty lots of good answers here. So I think we have to move on. Um, so I but have we... one question. Um, and this is from Michael. And he says, what does type territorial mean in the carbon atlas? Um, territorial is really measuring it per, for the whole country. So it's kind of measuring more what the uh, the China as a territory is producing not so much per person, so it's not divided by the people. Yeah. Okay. And I think do explore it for yourself. I think it's a fantastic tool where you can see around and try maybe also individual countries. So I will go back to sharing my screen. And uh, so I'm putting this up now. Um, oops, not really on the right slide here at the moment. You can see my screen already, no? Yeah? Yeah. Yes, but Okay. So uh, the other one um, I would recommend um, to have a look uh, uh, is, oh, so it's the next one, which is the climatewatchdata.org. Because uh, there you can also find the information around the vulnerability. So if you go to this website, you get ideas on how this has been um, calculated, the one I used in the Kahoot with you. And you also get some more information on individual countries, uh, which have uh, very high emissions and, and you can explore them. So this is maybe a good link for you if you want to, to actually dig deeper into um, things to go there as well. Okay, so then we go move on to the next part. And um, I have seen that our uh, other facilitators, Jennifer and Helen, have joined now. I'll come to you as well. Um, so we will go now to the uh, to our future scenarios. Will be the next task. As part of this task, you will have a little coffee, water, whatever break. Um, so so when you do look at the slides for yourself, you can decide either you spend the whole time and looking at the slides, or you might want to get a glass of water or whatever you need. Um, so it's it's 10 minutes, but in, includes the five minutes break if you need a break, because maybe some people of you don't need a break as it's only two hour session, but there is a chance to take, to get some water or something if you want to. So the first part will be, um, 10 minutes on your own so you have time to look through the slide pack for yourself if you haven't done before the session so that you have to get a bit of an overview and what you will learn with this activity is how the future might unfold if we don't do anything so what is going to happen uh, in the next 20 years if we don't do anything and then also what how could it look like if we do things so if we do actually put uh, solutions into place how would then the story um, develop in the next 20 years so we will share this with you. Um, so we will have um, groups of six people, six or seven people in each group. And uh, you will have, most of you will have a facilitator. If you don't have a facilitator, try to establish who wants to share the slide pack and uh, tries to organize the slides. But more, in most cases, you will have a facilitator. But I will kind of pop in to the ones who don't have a facilitator, but just get going if you realize there is no facilitator in your group. Um, group one and two will use a negative future slide pack, so they will actually make it into an order what is going to happen if we don't do anything. Then all the other groups will do the positive futures. And this is because really it is not so nice to do the negative futures, but obviously it's important that we know what's going to happen if we don't do anything. So if you're in the negative futures group, I hope we will cheer you up afterwards by when you see the positive futures narrated by another group. But please try to understand what is going to happen if we don't do anything. So it's your decision in the group, because obviously we don't know for um, totally for sure what is going to happen in a year's time. So it's an agreement in your group uh, what you think is already happening. So you might say actually certain slides, for example, flooding is already happening. So you might want to put them at the beginning. Um, then you could agree in your group what is happening in two years time, in five years time, in 10 years time, up to 2038. And um, 
you don't need to fully agree if people say that something is happening now and others say it's happening in five years you can actually say this when you're actually talking about the story that there was a that you do not fully agree that people had different opinion on this but you might also consider that some things you think are already happening are maybe happening on a smaller scale at the moment and you might want to highlight that these things are going to happen in five years time on a bigger scale so you might want to put the slide further down the line to highlight when it becomes actually more prominent and more people will actually uh, experience in these negative consequences so this will be the first two groups um, and the other groups will work on the positive future. So you have a similar task. You have lots of positive solutions which you can implement. And it's up to your group to decide which one you want to do first. So do you think, for example, that everyone who is running a company at the moment should be made accountable? And if they're doing anything bad about climate change, they should actually go into jail. So you might put the slides on the accountability first. Or someone might say, let's put education first. First, everyone needs to learn about this. So you might want to put education first. Again, if there is a disagreement in your group, don't fight it out to the end. Just actually leave the two slides next to each other. And it's okay when you narrate the story that you say, um, part of our group thought we should first concentrate on education. But another uh, group, um, part of our group said we should first make everyone accountable. So it's, it's okay to disagree on these things. So don't spend too long on it because there are lots of slides. So you might want to actually understand more than only one slide where to put it in what order you want to unfold things. There's one specific rule for the positive um, groups that you're not allowed to talk about obstacles in this case. You know, normally when we talk about this issue and say, oh, we should really uh, implement um, innovation everywhere, or we should actually educate everyone, then people will all normally start to say, oh, but this doesn't work because so-and-so will not allow it, or because it doesn't work in our country or so. It is not allowed for this exercise. For this exercise, it's really for you to get a positive vision into your head, how it could work if you would have all the power in the world. Yeah, if you would have all the power and you would decide which are the positive actions that should come in, in uh, now, in a year's time, in two years time, in 10 years time, and you could implement them all, how would you do it? And obviously there might be obstacles and these kind of things. And we will talk about them in the future session as in session three and four, but not today. Today is really for you to, to really kind of get a really nice image how it could look like, like if we do all the positive things. So this is your task, no? Okay, so it will be look so that we have 10 minutes now on your own, where you look through the slide pack and uh, you obviously don't know whether you're in the negative or positive future. So the likelihood that you're in the positive is quite high. So you might want to look through the positive future slides. Um, or actually, we, we might put the negative, could be best maybe if you put, uh, I don't know, um, is uh, Dallas, are you ready to put everyone in their group? Yes, I'm ready to put everyone in their group. Um, and just a reminder, when people do do a bio break, to please not uh, log out of Zoom. Yeah. So then actually, we, uh, I would suggest that you go into your room now when you see the link in a moment, that your facilitator will shortly tell you whether um, you are negative future. If there's no one telling you, because it will be only two groups, that it's a negative future, then please look only at the positive future slide desk now to prepare yourself in these 10 minutes. And then you have 20 minutes in your group to make the story and to make a, uh, to, to think about how would you narrate the whole story um, if you would uh, put, make a positive story or if you would make a negative or troubled future. So I think the best is to go into the groups now, let your facilitator tell you whether you have to look at the negative pack or the positive pack. You have 10 minutes to look at it for yourself. Then you go stay in this room, obviously. You unmute yourself and then you have a 20 minute discussion and we will automatically get you back in 30 minutes time. And then the positive as negative futures will narrate first and then the positive future will narrate second. Yeah. And if you are, um, you might not be the group narrating the story. If you are not the one narrating, it's still pay closely attention because add things which where you were actually having good ideas in your group and you might want to add them to the group narrating at the end. Okay, if there's any question, please put them in the chat or ask your facilitator. Um, and then I think we would could now show the, uh, the link. So please go to your link, ask whether you are negative or positive futures. And if, if there's no one there, then you're without a facilitator, but then you also have to do the positive future. Okay.
So far, rooms 10, 11, 12, and 13 will not have a facilitator. Okay. Okay, I will open up the rooms now. Hello, it's Helen here. Can you hear me? Oh, hello, Helen. So, um, yeah. yeah. Yes, that was really nice. We had a nice group. Good discussion. Yeah, okay. This is good. Yeah, sorry that it's not longer. I think maybe we should have it longer. <laughs> but, uh, you can go on and on. <laughs> yeah, obviously, feel free. If you have the feeling you didn't do the full story in your groups, then obviously you have afterwards, you could make your own story you know, for yourself and say, okay, I want to do the full story now in my own time. So obviously you can do this. You have the slide deck now and you can do this maybe after the session today if you want to do the full story, how you would expect it to, to happen. No? Yeah, but I have seen a lot of like nice smiles at me at the moment. So it seems like you had a good time, which is nice. So I think I would like to then, we will now narrate the story. So we will first um, see the negative story from one of the group and the other group who had the negative stories needs to really pay very close attention whether they say everything you also discussed or whether you want to highlight anything from your own, uh, how you designed the negative stories which you want to highlight. So this will be the first 10 minutes now. And then we have the positive story, which will be again one group narrating and the others can all actually add things which you had in your discussion where you want to highlight something else which they might not talk about. Yeah, so when we have agreed on who is narrating before, because for the facilitators, it's often better when they know that this is coming their way. So I think it's Jennifer who will talk us through the negative story now or someone in your group. Also. And I think everyone else might want to switch off the video and the sound now, because otherwise it might interfere with the transmission for some people. So let's give Jennifer the the space to share and to talk. Thanks, Jennifer. So if, if you keep going. Yeah, moving. I'll begin. Uh, thanks, Petra, for this opportunity. Um, so our group uh, had uh, a bit of discussion live and in chat about things that are happening now, two years, five years, and 10 years. And uh, so I'll sort of cluster these into to different categories, sort of things related to people, things related to land, and things related to water. And so you can see here uh, for items that we identified happening now is begins with us ignoring the warnings and the lack of knowledge and our behaviors like taking a lot of flights and having policies um, that protect business interests and not uh, climate or people in the long run. We're seeing climate refugees already, and um, we're seeing, you know, the detrimental impacts of uh, counterfeit air conditioning. In terms of the water, we're seeing uh, the change in the water becoming more acidic and flooding, uh, as well as um, the the lack of change in the uh, shipping industry as well. So all things related to water. And the next two years in this uh, negative scenario that's troubled, uh, we see that businesses continue not to change and that uh, we see more punitive uh, shifts like insurance companies not uh, insuring people, resources dip, another economic impact. And as things accelerate in five years, we see uh, imbalances like heat waves uh, causing many uh, problems, uh, in particular destroying lives, crops, deaths. Uh, again, water being a key issue, the black market for water, water stress, 
increasing urbanization and then discouragement through the collapse of the climate targets. Then in the, the 10 year frame, we see just very uh, large scale uh, major disruption in terms of uh, economic disruption, political disruption with war, um, you know, costs and balances, uh, really the collapse of the economic systems, the impacts on the land in terms of permafrost, uh, the deforestation uh, accelerating as well and impacting the carbon levels. It all really continues to go into a total tailspin with the uh, impact on uh, biodiversity being cut in half and continued uh, impacts of the Arctic thawing uh, impacting methane release, which is very bad as we know, and then that causing the sea rise uh, impacting island nations. So it's, it's not pretty, uh, this scenario that we've uh, created here. That's, that's it. Anyone feeling a little heavy? Yeah, thanks, Jennifer. It's a, does anyone wants to add something from either Jennifer's group or from the other negative future group where you had something similar or you had something maybe different that you thought something was happening earlier than Jennifer's group thought or anything to add from anyone from the negative futures? Um, I could add from from my group, we we had a, a very similar timeline as as to Jennifer's, but we started off with with the context the context of urbanization, and went forth on on this this knowledge of of cities continuing to develop um, without anyone really understanding the consequences of that. Okay, so, so it was very similar, or did you differ in in any way? Did you it was there a point where you would differ? Did it differ from Jennifer's story? Yeah, I think that was the only difference that we started off with urbanization instead of thinking of it as, as super far away. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. No, thanks, Ashley. Yeah. Okay. So I think this is uh, really negative and we should shake it out. Normally when I would have you face to face, I would say, shake it all out, shake it, put it away. We don't want to see this. Obviously it's our future. We are still designing our future and hopefully we design it in a better way and we won't have, we will do things now which will change the future and will not uh, doesn't unfold the way we have just seen. So hopefully you will now give us lots of inspiration how we can do it better and how we will actually make it into a positive future. So I would like to ask the first narrator uh, to tell us now about the positive stories, which I think is Rajul, no? Yes, Petra. And I've started sharing my screen. I hope you can see it. And so this is... Uh, the output of a discussion in group seven, and that's the group I was facilitating. And so we had a really nice discussion about what should we start doing right from the beginning. And so immediate actions that the group felt needed to be taken were, uh, we decided to put the onus on people, all individuals, uh, that it's all individuals who need to start acting. And when we start taking small actions, in both our daily lives, personally, but also professionally, we'll find that you know we, we're making great contributions to to help counter all global challenges. Uh, another really great uh, input was uh, essentially something simple that we can start off with is just changing our diets, and one that's one of the simplest steps all of us can take in our lives. Uh, moving from from meat based diets to to vegetarian diets, uh, quite a simple change in most parts of the world. Uh, also uh, bringing in uh, forestation, growing more plants and trees uh, and naturally uh, capturing uh, you know, carbon dioxide and countering uh, global greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, things that are happening already around us like telepresence and innovation happening for, for making technology uh, accessible, affordable to counter all our global problems. And then yes, thinking of efficiencies, of course, the need for political cooperation, uh, women's education can play a big role as can family planning, et cetera. So we are countering population. And then really thinking about different ways by which we can think of renewables and more extensive use across the world, uh, smart grid building management systems, uh, thinking of producing energy 
uh, and of course, yes, yeah, efficient modes of transport, then improving the way we use land, bringing in more accountability, reducing corruption across the world, uh, thinking of, yes, more uh, viable transportation systems while reducing emissions, water efficiencies, and then thinking of uh, solutions for decarbonizing uh, economies across the world. And then, yes, things in the long term, like 10 years and beyond, well, change of behaviors that, that systemically can, can help us move positively forward. Uh, and that would lead to improvements in yes, standards of living, super goods that are established. But hopefully, at some point in time in the long term, our population on the earth will stabilize and the population rise would would start to taper off. And then yes, carbon dioxide emissions can reduce. And ultimately as a last resort, we felt that, you know, if, if still we're not able to counter uh, greenhouse gas emissions, then we can start capturing carbon because that's such an energy intensive process as well. So this was really our scenario uh, that we built with a very young group who were very, very excited talking about solutions. Okay. Over to you. Good, thank you. And is there anyone who wants to add something uh, from this group or also from the other groups now? Is there anything you would like to highlight which was maybe different in your group or which you want to um, say, yes, this is really important. We, we thought this was the most important thing we should do now. So it's open to everyone to contribute now. Yeah, Natalia, yeah, okay. No, Petra, it's very interesting to see that education seems to be a common theme across the different world groups i think that in the group that uh, i was that was definitely a factor combined also with the need of changing those behaviors and embedding all the stuff that we're learning from this specific program or from having carbon literacy through the education system is definitely a factor that contributes to the process and seems to be a, a common team uh, the group i work on was also very interested on all the changes that are connected to uh, the relation between, for example, our dietary decisions, land use, afforestation, mm -hmm. uh, nitrogen uh, fixing, like the connections between the different uh, possibilities to create that possible future. And, and we seem to be organizing them in blocks. So it was like the education block on one side, the policy action and accountability on the other the stuff related to agriculture, land use, and food on the other, also everything energy related. So all those blocks were definitely there and, and it's definitely a connection with what Rajul was saying, but also like the perspective of, of how other issues come to the table as well and, and are prioritized by at different levels, let's say. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> Okay, we are holding, uh, showing hands now. Um, I think Reich was first on my screen, at least. Obviously, I can't see you all, but Reich, Werner, with you. Um, yeah, so um, I think what this exercise also showed is that you can't really do this chronologically and do one thing first. And then once that is done, you start the second thing. So uh, our group had some uh, or we realized that you have to tackle all these things at once and kind of really take an integrated approach since uh, the system that we're working with is so multifaceted. So it kind of all happens, has to happen at once, which makes it seem very overwhelming, but uh, is probably also the way to go. And we also realized that uh, many of the things that were on this list are uh, initiated already so that is a, a positive note yeah 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 i think there was it's nothing on the list on the list which was impossible it's all solutions which do exist on a small scale maybe at the moment but it, it does all exist so there's nothing which needs to be invented kind of so which is right mm -hmm. yeah so i think amai you wanted to say something yes uh it's it's like uh, from our discussion uh i felt like we needed to end identify first uh, because I have like uh, a different plan compared to Rajal. Uh, we agreed, yeah, we agreed on having uh, education as first. Uh, this is the basic for sure. But then afterward, uh, we tried to pick the highest emitter 
so we can have a fast um, reduction in uh, CO2, uh, which is actually actually the transportation. So if we started first with the transportation and we have a really good plan for the uh, coming two years, five years. Uh, and up to uh, 2035, uh, we will have a faster reduction. And then mm -hmm. it came uh, the efficiency. We need to increase the efficiency um, wherever it's possible. And the last aspect is uh, actually to integrate the renewable energy after increasing the efficiency as much as uh, possible. So uh, mm -hmm. because actually the, the major uh, contributor to the CO2, it is the energy sector, then followed by cement sector and, and so on and so forth. So um, actually this was the difference between our group and maybe uh, Rajal uh, group. Okay, yeah, that's interesting. So people had quite different discussions there. Yeah? So maybe someone else who would like to share what your um, uh, insights were. Is there someone else? I might not see them all because I have four different uh, screens. So if you, someone else puts up the hand, maybe you just start talking if you want to talk because I might not see you all. I think Ellen wants to talk. Ellen is already talking, but I think her... My so Helen, team. are you talking? Helen, you are not. I am. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Now, yep. now we can hear you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. In in our group, we had similar discussions to uh, some of those other issues, but we um, we very much felt that people and politicians were the key ones to consider, and we spent quite a while debating which was going to be more important of those, and very much going back to that issue of timing and what's what's urgent rather than what's important, and it's really hard to unpick those. Um, we took a vote and we went with people. We decided because we can act very quickly and possibly more quickly than politicians. However, we have found recently that politicians can act quickly when needed. <laughs> much more quickly than they ever have in the past. So we know that this is a, a practice, the current situation is a trial run for taking urgent action. Mm. Yeah, that's a good, a good point. Yeah, that we, they were impressing us with acting much faster than we ever thought they could. <laughs> mm. Yeah, definitely. Okay, no, I think there's lots happening in the chat. I can see that there are lots of people also discussing in the chat. Um, is there anyone um, who would like to say something else here to everyone? Also, if you just speak up, because say because I can't see everyone in one go because you're too many slides, too too many pages for me. Anyone just speak up, please, if you want to share your insights. You can also, if you go to the participant section, you can raise your hand, and then I'll be able to see if you're raising your hand. Yeah. Okay. Maybe not anymore. Okay, then. Um, yeah, I think it was great. And also that you have, as obviously there is no one answer, one right answer, because we are still designing our future. It depends on our action now. And hopefully you had good insights in your group and that you thought, yeah, this could actually work if you do oh, it this way. Uh, that this could actually work. So, um, so I hope so. To please do make uh, to take some notes afterwards because obviously question one in your assessment form is exactly about this. What you have just done. What should we do worldwide to get to carbon neutral by 2038? So all the different answers you have given, you can write them down now um, and as they make it in bullet points. Or today you might also already write it a bit more as a story. Uh, uh, already because you have just done the story. So you might want to write question one as a story now to actually put your vision down how it should unfold and how you want to actually, as what you want to happen in the next uh, 20 years so that we actually get down to carbon neutral by 2038. Yeah, so please do this after the session. Um, and as I say, there is no, as in the future, we are still designing our future. So it's up to us to really decide what should be done. And, and I'm sure there are different ways to a good future. So it's okay to disagree on this part as long as we all try to work towards a good future. Um, can you see my slides now? Yes. Yeah, yeah good. Yes, okay. Good. So then, so this was actually that we shared our story. So we just finished this. And as I say, if you want to look to the negative future slides, if pack, if you haven't done it, please do after the session. You have both packs. Or if you want to do to look through the positive futures in more detail, make your own story or make notes from it, please do so as well. 
Um, and I really would recommend that you um, write down your key insights from today's session. Um, and when you have done this, you don't need to do any further prep for session three. So I just make these notes so that you don't forget them because obviously we will have a big question, a big, not a great big question. This is, <laughs> I just read question. We have a big gap until the next session. So because next week, um, it's actually in three weeks time when we meet again. So you might otherwise forget all the nice solutions we had today if you don't make a note today or tomorrow about it. And then we see you again in session three where we will actually do more of the positive futures, but we will also, um, uh, as in the positive solutions, but we will also start how to calculate them because obviously at the moment it was just based on your general assessment, but in the next session you will learn actually how to analyze and calculate the different um, solutions. So what if I do this solution, how much will I save here? If I do this solution, how much will we save there? So we will, the next one will be a lot about um, 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 about the calculation. And it, it sounds a bit more scary. If you don't like math, it sounds maybe scary to you, but it's pretty straightforward. It's not too difficult. And you will get lots of um, nice new insights and we will make it quite fun as well. So you will do a quiz again. We will kind of guess is this activity more, this activity more, and you will kind of try to um, establish what you what you know about it, what you guess, and maybe you have a gut feeling for certain actions as well, which one will have more impact and which one will have less, but you will also know how to calculate it. So this will be part of the next session. And we will talk about the climate science, because I think it's important for you that you understand how these solutions, why they are all successful and why we should do them uh, now and what should be the next one, the first one we are doing. And we are talking about about the, the cl climate science, which is behind it uh, next time. So you get a good understanding, what are the most important things you need to know about climate change science, about carbon sinks and so on, and how this is related to the high impact climate solutions so that you can easily talk to someone else and explain it to them as well. And I hope that lots of you actually want to become trainers also that, because I would really hope that a lot, because you come from very different universities that a lot of you Maybe uh, after you have done the training yourself, after all four sessions, you might want to become student trainers to other students, which would be fantastic. And I would love to help you to set it up in your university if you want any help. So hopefully you will actually make a note of all these things and we will share um, this as teaching resources with you if you want to uh, train other people, if you want to train your fellow students or to train lecturers on this. So we will share this with you after you have done all the four sessions. Okay, so I hope this was for today. So if you have any, this is again for who has helped with designing the slides for today. Um, and um, we would also, as I would also like to thank very much all the facilitators who have um, been so kind to actually join in to, today and who have helped with facilitating the, um, the second hour. We will need facilitators again for the final session. We don't need it in session three, which is in two weeks, uh, three weeks time, but we will need it for session four, which is after Christmas in the new year. Um, so if you want to help with a session four, please do send an email to Natalia so that she knows that you are willing to help in session four. And we have a pre-meeting with people who are willing to help as facilitators the day before or two days, I think no, one day before, actually it's on the Monday because it's always a Tuesday when we meet. So we will invite you to a pre-meeting if you want to be a facilitator for session four, which will be in January. So then send an email, please, to Natalia. Otherwise, if you have any other questions, please also send an email to Natalia. Uh, Natalia gets lots of emails. I'm really sorry, Natalia. <laughs> you, you get a lot of work with this. That's okay. <laughs> if I don't respond efficiently enough, just send it again and it will go on top of my inbox and, um, and we, uh, we will be able, we hopefully will be able to be up to date on on your concerns and questions yeah and 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 you might know that there is a celebration in the us now so you might not get a, an immediate answer because um, i believe a lot of people are now going on a break in the us uh, for thanksgiving am i right yeah or not i think most of you know yes you are we're going on break uh, thursday and friday yeah okay so uh, so I as we wish you all a good a good break. And then if you have any questions now, I will stay behind. Um, so um, Dallas will make me the host now so that I can talk to anybody who wants to stay behind because you might have questions about anything or you want to talk about anything which you had in the session or so. So I'm happy to talk to anybody who wants to have a little bit of a chat after this session. Otherwise, as I say, I would like to thank everyone who has helped today and I'm looking forward 
um, to seeing you all in, in the next session in session three. Okay, thanks very much, everyone. Goodbye then. So actually, I would like to see you before you go all the way. Can you unmute and and uh, at least I take the video off actually, right? And it's for to say goodbye. I think it's always nice to see everyone. Okay. Bye, <laughs> Bye everyone. Thanks Bye. for joining today and for all the input you have given. Okay. See you. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Yes. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, bye. <laughs> All right, Petra, meet you the host. Thank you. Okay, bye. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, please do. Thank you. Yeah, so bye. Stay bye. behind if you have a question. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Always bye. It's always bye. nice to see that there are real people at the other end, <laughs> not just my <laughs> screen. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. See you. Bye. And okay. So everyone is leaving. I say, if you, if anyone has a question, please or want to discuss anything, please do stay behind. And otherwise, goodbye. It's funny. Do you also all have a noise when you someone's going out at the moment? Yes. No. Yeah. Sometimes it beeps. Yeah, it's beeping. For me, it's beeping with every person mm -hmm. leaving at the moment, which is quite funny. So it's a lot of beeping. Yes. <laughs> That's okay. what happens when you have 140 students. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think there's Adamo. Um, do you want to ask a question? I can see that you're still there. Oh. I don't have any question, but uh, I was very excited with this session, and uh, uh, I don't have any question by now. But uh, I should probably try to ask you later on. Just I don't have any question for now. If you okay. have any other questions, just send me an email, and and I will be happy to answer them or to pass them to Professor Petra if if need be. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, thanks very much. Thanks for joining us, Adam. Okay, bye. <laughs> and thank you for your help with one of the groups as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. There's still a, oops. Is there any other question from someone? I think I can still see Krishna. Krishna, do you have a question? I think that it's safe to say that you can end the meeting now. Yeah, is everyone? Yes. Josue, Josue, any question? Yes, there's only three more connected, yeah. so. Okay, good. Thank I think that you can go ahead and, and end the meeting for everybody. Yeah, okay, then I will just say thanks also to everyone to Rajul, Helen, Jennifer, to Thank yourself. Thank you so much, Natalia. ladies. Thanks to everyone for helping and have a very good <laughs> evening or day, depending on the time. Uh, so thanks, everyone. everyone yeah? Thanks, thanks so much. Have a very, very nice everyone. Thanksgiving to the people in the US. Yeah. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving, <laughs> Happy Thanksgiving <laughs> to everybody. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thank Bye. You. Thanks for Bye. 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 Bye.